Do they proceed along the path of reform, where in the words of Article 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural rights? Or are they in the rut of a dictatorship and a false process of dialogue leading nowhere? Not only have the Al-Khalifas not moved a centimetre towards democracy, but they've tortured and locked up all those who speak up for democracy and human rights. Amongst some 3,000 political prisoners are every single one of the previous speakers at these press conferences who returned to Bahrain. I've just mentioned some of them, Hassan Mushema, the leader of the Haq movement, Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, uh, co-founder of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, Abdul Jalil Al Singhes, head of the Haq movement's Human Rights Bureau, Nabil Rajab, president of the Gulf Center for Human Rights, Mohammed Al Taja, a human rights lawyer who defended peaceful protesters, Ibrahim Sharif, General Secretary of the Secular Liberal National Democratic Action Society, and Abdul, Abdul Wahab Hussein, a political activist who played a leading role in 2011. Those were all previous speakers at these press conferences who, when they went back to Bahrain, found themselves arrested and in prison. The government's policy of arresting, torturing, and handing out long prison sentences to their opponents has largely been met by peaceful protests in the past, but as civilians continue to be tortured and killed in custody, some individuals have retaliated. Thus, after the torture and death in custody on February the 27th of 22-year-old Jafar al-Durazi, a bomb killed three policemen in Dai from the UAE, Pakistan and Yemen, also injuring some others. The police then inflicted an unlawful collective punishment on the village and they attacked the headquarters of al wefaq and three political organizations were arbitrarily listed as terrorists. You know, the late President John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. That wise statement is being played out on the streets of Bahrain. The provocative use of foreign security forces brought in and naturalized to oppress the native population and ultimately to create a Sunni majority which might show gratitude and loyalty to the autocrats is calculated to make peaceful opponents despair, particularly when it's accompanied by systematic displacement of Shias from positions of responsibility and authority throughout the higher education sector health services, and business. The appearance of a UAE officer in the day casualty lists also gives the lie to the statement that GCC forces have no direct part in policing the disturbances. But increasingly, the role of the GCC in Bahrain and parallels between the violations of human rights in the various Gulf autocracies must come under public scrutiny. The Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers has just reported on a visit to the UAE and Qatar at the end of January, but he's never been to Bahrain, though in both countries dissidents are convicted on evidence obtained by means of torture. The existence of a joint security pact between the UAE and Bahrain promotes exchange of information between the two states about their peaceful opponents facilitating their persecution. Both states freely use torture against political prisoners and in neither state are freedoms of expression and of assembly respected. The same is true in spades in regard to Saudi Arabia, which escapes cutting edge censure because it supplies much of the oil in the Western countries and is a major customer for our weapons. Two major shortcomings of the special procedures generally are that they don't consider transnational human rights phenomena and they don't report on credible evidence unless it's confirmed by visits. Thus, in the case of the Gulf countries, which are ruled by, ruled by Sunni majorities, Sunni monarchies, the common threat of persecution 
and marginalization of their Shia populations is ignored. And the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion has never visited any of those countries, a matter I hope is going to be raised with him at the meeting of the Human Rights Council in Geneva this week, where there will be a powerful delegation from the Bahraini opposition. All the UN special procedures should be able to issue reports based on reliable testimony from the media, from NGOs, and multiple corroborating statements from private individuals. Otherwise, states can avoid criticism merely by postponing the visits by the special procedures indefinitely, as has happened in the case of Bahrain with the special report, the rapporteur on torture. But why has there been no word by the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, with 3,412 people in detention last Friday? Why has the Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers not looked at the proceedings of the Kangaroo Court, which sentenced the Bahrain 13 to long periods of imprisonment based on testimonies extracted by means of torture? Why has the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression of religion not commented on the total exclusion of the Shia from the professions, education, broadcasting, health and government, and the expulsion of thousands of Shia migrant workers. We know that the special procedures are starved of resources because countries like Bahrain don't want them to work, but the stakeholders do have the opportunity of raising their voices at the open sessions of the Human Rights Council this week, and I hope they'll do so. The questions of human rights, democracy, and good government were all originally taken up by the opposition in Bahrain on a non-sectarian basis, but they've been forced into a sectarian mold by the treatment of the Shia population. The allies of the al-Khalifas in this project are Salafists, a hardline extremist group with an ideology akin to the Wahhabi in Wahhabism of Saudi Arabia, which denies the rights of Shias to call themselves Muslim and in some countries are calling for their annihilation. They're increasingly infiltrating government, though it has to be said the regime has already been carried, carrying out their program without needing to be prompted. Christopher Davidson, in his book After the Sheikhs, predicts the collapse of the Gulf monarchies due to mounting internal pressures including the wholesale persecution of the Shia populations. The short-term interests of the West, and of the UK in particular, rely heavily on the maintenance of stability in the region, so we should be working hard to counter the sectarianism of these autocracies and to promote de demo de democratic inclusivity in which all citizens are equal and all systems of religion or belief are protected. These principles should take priority over alliances with rulers whose main object is to stay in power and to grab the wealth that should belong as of right to their peoples. 